Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Th thank you for joining us here. Welcome online to the, those of you watching on our Facebook channel and watching on weforum.org. This um, issue briefing is our third of the day. We have a hectic schedule today. Um, the head headline is Digital Wildfires in a Hyperconnected World. I'm just going to start this session by reading a passage from our Global Risks Report in 2012. The global risk of massive digital misinformation sits at the center of a constellation of technological and geopolitical risks ranging from terrorism to cyber attacks and the failure of global governance. Hyperconnectivity could enable digital wildfires to wreak havoc in the real world. It considers the challenge presented by the misuse of an open and easily accessible system and the greater danger of misguided attempts to prevent such outcomes. Now I'm going to ask our panel, first of all, whether they thought we were slightly hyperbolic or whether that was an, uh, indeed um, a, a, a relatively prescient thought. And bearing in mind Kenneth Rigoff's comments that Davos always gets it wrong, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, so please, without further ado, this is not about me, it's about my, my amazing panel here. Rebecca McKinnon is the Director of Ranking Digital Rights in the USA, a, an activist uh, uh, and, a, and a former journalist herself. Stephen Adler is President and Editor-in-Chief of Thomson Reuters. Rebecca, let's turn to you. Digital wildfires. Are we living in an era of digital wildfires? Well, certainly we're in an era where anybody can be a journalist, right? Uh, and so you have all kinds of people putting out information and gaining traction, uh, and you have these memes starting. And, and let's not forget the Arab Spring was also a digital wildfire. Uh, so you have both positive and negative wildfires in the sense that sometimes somebody will report facts and they will get out there in a way that couldn't have gotten out before. Uh, before Facebook, uh, the Arab Spring would not have happened because the outrage over a, a man immolating himself in a market and, and that information spreading uh, through social media uh, would not have happened, and, and the organizing that happened around that would not have happened, uh, or the outrage of a young man being tortured in Egypt and the information about that spreading, that certainly would not have gotten to mainstream media in the past. And so there's all kinds of ways in which people have been using uh, digital media and the, and the fact that anyone can be a reporter for good, to advocate for human rights, to advocate for social justice. Uh, so let's not forget that. And yes, there are plenty of, of demagogues uh, and racists and, and populists of, of different kinds who are also manipulating the media, uh, putting out information and trying to gain traction. Um, so there's all these kinds of things. I think the answer is, is not censorship or trying to decide what we need to anoint arbiters of what is true and what is false because frankly that's just going to we're going to, to really be handing more power to dictators if we do that. We're, we're, go, we're opening ourselves up to greater abuse and censorship and surveillance if we do that. What we need to figure out is how to create a healthier information ecosystem, whereby when something is true or something is false, there are communities who can come together and, and, and place a check on it. Um, that there's more trust in s different sources of information so that you don't have entire groups of people who distrust journalists so much that they're willing to believe anything that, that they would like to believe, whether or not it's true, because there are no other credible people in their community who they trust who can say, no, th this is not true and here's why. So, so I think we need to come up, uh, we need to innovate more. We need to innovate more with community journalism. Uh, I, I think the platform certainly can work with communities to figure out how you can strengthen um, people with counter arguments, uh, but censorship was not the answer. Community journalism sounds, sounds, sounds laudable and, and innovating also does, but it also is hard to escape the feeling that fake news organizations, for example, hate sites are extremely well organized and they mm -hmm. they work together very well and, and I read an article um, from December in which you were quoted and I don't believe it was your quote um, but the, the 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 sense was that these these sites are encircling conventional mainstream news media sites or mainstream websites and it's getting out of control so you know but what do you do about it exactly 
Right. I'd love to know. Um, <laughs> again, I don't think it's censorship. I think, you know, part of the problem is that you get and and this this happens throughout history that that people with a very pointed agenda um, with with rich backers find a way to be very focused and very strategic and to get messages out and so you need to figure out how you counter that do you build a movement you know pr part of the problem is that people kind of on the human rights and free speech side have less of one message, right? Um, but I think we've seen <laughs> uh, throughout history the ability to counter lies and demagoguery with, with checks and balances and, and ways of, of countering that. And so I think we're in a moment right now uh, where, let's say, the bad guys seem to be winning, um, again, depending on your point of view. But I think it's just a moment. And I, I think it's in, in part due to some specific outcomes of, of specific elections that a lot of people are very upset about. Uh, but again, I, I think that we, that liberals in particular, uh, need to be very, very careful about reaching for essentially authoritarian solutions to a problem of authoritarianism. Uh, we've we've seen that road before uh, around certain types of socialism and communism. It didn't end well. Let's not go there. Uh, Stephen, talking of authoritarian solutions, as a media organization, you're much more highly regulated than a tech company, for example. Does that give you a commercial disadvantage? Um, I don't think we're highly regulated uh, at all, actually. Um, I mean, we operate largely in a uh, globally um, in a position where as long as we're uh, producing accurate uh, information, by and large, we're okay. Um, because we're operating in 200 different locations, over 100 countries around the world. Obviously, there are different regimes. In some places, there's more regulation than others. But we, we try to operate fairly consistently uh, around the world. I, I'm not a believer in government uh, regulation of media. I am a strong believer in uh, transparency and, and free flow of information. I think, by and large, um, ideas compete with each other, as Rebecca said, um, and that um, particularly the internet and social media are amazingly self-correcting. Um, yeah, and again, I, somebody raised a, a, the point yesterday at, at a session saying that if uh, Hillary Clinton had won the election, we wouldn't be talking so much about fake news. Um, and I think that's true. I, I think people, a lot of people didn't like that outcome, and they're blaming it more on fake news than probably they should. Of course, fake news uh, is a very old issue. Uh, you know, back to ancient Rome, back to uh, almost any political campaign going back in history, um, people were saying bad things about their opponent. And frankly, the ability to challenge that wasn't even as great um, as it is now. Uh, I mean, you have the example of Wikipedia, where there's this constant conversation going on and challenge. Um, but, but also, I mean, I've just been struck um, as somebody who uh, researches books as well as uh, doing journalism over the last 10 years, 15 years, the amount of useful, accurate information available to the world electronically has burgeoned in a way that has almost never been seen in history. I mean, we're back to sort of Gutenberg days. Um, and it's, it's an extraordinary um, blossoming of, uh, of information. And while certainly we've, we've seen um, people making some stuff up, um, I've also found that if people in the public want to check it, and we'll get to that question of how do you help the public want to check it. But if the public wants to check the information, uh, when I go on and I see something that looks suspicious, uh, you obviously go and look at other sources. Um, you see what other people are saying. You do some independent research. And you can pretty quickly sort out um, what's true and what isn't. Um, but I do want to emphasize the amount of accurate information out there is greater than ever in the history of the world. And we shouldn't sort of get too depressed about that, because about some of the uh, the side effects or the challenges that we're facing. Um, government regulation is, is not the answer. Um, I think uh, greater public education, people learning news literacy, civics education, people understanding better um, how to sort uh, between uh, accurate and inaccurate information. 
uh, it would certainly be useful. Um, you know, I would ad certainly advocate that uh, media organizations like ourselves um, be self-reflective about uh, how they behave because there's a question of how much do you proliferate the, the stuff that clearly is not accurate and we've seen some instances of that recently. Um, I think news organizations that rely on a business model that essentially requires you to have absolutely massive scale um, you know, are creating a problem and I think uh, really need to think about whether that's an approach that's viable in the long run if, if, if your job is to find clickbait and, and um, get the most possible readers, then you are feeding into it. So I think it's useful uh, to look at those business models um, and it's useful for organiz media organizations like ours to have, uh, to have standards. So we have trust principles written into the charter of Reuters that requires us to be independent and free of bias. And I actually have to go before the board of directors every year and attest that we are following them. And, and I think uh, you know, news organizations that want to be responsible, that, that put in some standards for themselves, uh, that that would be useful. And I think civics education will have some usefulness. And just a final point, um, I think uh, if you want to be trusted uh, and you want to differentiate yourself from fake news providers, you probably have to provide more transparency than traditional news organizations have thought they needed to do in the past. When I was at the Wall Street Journal years ago, it was kind of a mantra that you never talked about how you got the news. You were concerned about the legal consequences of revealing that publicly, and you felt that your work spoke for itself because you were a trusted organization. Now I think you have to prove, um, you have to be trustworthy and then you have to prove it. You have to say, how did you get the story? How did you source? Um, how, did, how did you parse uh, information and think about what was accurate and what, what wasn't? And we're gonna do more of that going forward. And I think a lot of news organizations are thinking about doing that as well. Uh, and that's a really interesting impact on, on journalism, which I'd like to come to. But I think I, what I want to go to next is, is what you said yourself about it. In fact, you're obviously media literate. You're able to go in and, and, and check out the source and, and do a little bit of research about something. But other people aren't. And clickbait is very, very effective. And when you're, if you're an organization which is not driven by a commercial interest, but by an ideological interest, you're in a natural advantage to a conventional media company. So I'm wondering whether this proliferation, and I understand it could come from either, either political persuasion or, or, or any interest group, but does it pose an existential threat to the media as we see it today? Um, I'll, I'll try that. I, I mean, you know, I, I've been involved with conversations where people are like, you know, bloggers versus journalists, you know, professionals versus amateurs, and that it needs to be some kind of zero-sum game, which is absolutely not true. Uh, I, I think that the fact that um, citizens can report from their communities, they, they can push back, you know, I, I've been involved with situations where I was misquoted, and I could blog the fact that I was misquoted and taken out of context you know, when the, when the reporter did that. Or somebody in a community can write this story completely inaccurately, uh, exactly. you know. As much as the, and the, the, the it, original Well, sometimes piece. it does. Some, sometimes it gets shared as much, if not more. It, it, again, it sort of depends on the conversation that takes place around it. But I, I think the fact that, that media has been disintermediated is, over time, improving journalism. It's good for journalism. I think journalism still needs to evolve. Um, and, and as he says, um, become more transparent, figure out how to have a more, more of a conversation with the communities they're covering, uh, the communities they're reporting to, and how to involve the communities more in reporting on what's happening and involve them in sort of the fact-checking process and discussion about what, what is true and, and what is not. I think we're still in very early days. We're in a very bumpy period right now, but we have to work through it. We can't go back. There's no turning back. Um, and again, censorship is not the answer. Um, there are a lot of um, efforts right now, a lot of pressure being put on the social media platforms to crack down on extremism, to crack down on hate speech. And what you're seeing is that in their efforts to keep certain types of speech off the platforms, they're making all kinds of mistakes. And so journalists and activists are actually getting kicked off of Facebook or having journalistic reporting taken down because it mentions ISIS 
you know, or some people just having a debate about religion will mistakenly get uh, removed from social media because they mention some inflammatory terms or situations when they're not actually extremists. And so the desire to kind of clean up the conversation, to clean up the public conversation, I, th I think actually results in less trust and results in people being more inclined to believe fake things because they they don't feel that that they're they're really you know that they're really able to participate fully. Um, so I I think that's or that they can be edgy or controversial without having to worry about getting censored themselves, and and to have a robust debate. So we we need to be very very careful um, about again, how we go forward. And it, it's, again, really about innovating. And there are, of course, a lot of, there's a lot of hand-wringing about business model uh, for, for media. But I, I think we also want to think about, okay, if we want a media e ecosystem that sustains a society that respects human rights, sustains a society where we can have democracy, where minority rights can be respected, um, what kind of media, media ecosystem is that? And does some of it not need to be maximizing profit? Does some of it just need to be community sustained or paid by taxpayers or supported by communities or just kind of run at cost as a social good? We need to think about that um, because everything's really hanging on it. You know, I mean, it, life and death ends up hanging on it when, when people are making decisions about who to vote for based on what they're reading. So. So th there's, there's a lot of soul searching. I think we're all kind of collectively responsible in the end for the solutions. And, and I think as Steve was saying, there's, there's a lot of people who are upset because they were losers in a particular phase of politics and they're blaming everyone except themselves. Um, I think we, we can all contribute to solutions uh, if we make an effort. Oliver, I can stick to your question about whether fake news and this whole ecosystem is strangling uh, traditional news organizations. I, I think I, all of us have been struck with the extraordinary response that people have had um, post, uh, the, particularly the US election, in subscribing to traditional publications, subscribing to publications that are trustworthy. There's been an enormous um, uh, number of uh, additional subscriptions to Vanity Fair, to the New York Times, to many other uh, organizations. And uh, you know what I come back to is that I actually think people don't just want trusted news, they actually need it. And if they don't need it, we're in big trouble. But I think all the evidence suggests that they need it. I mean, what, what do they need it for? News is a subset of information, and people need information to make decisions. And ultimately, you use news to make decisions. You, you use it as a professional, as a business person, to make uh, decisions in your professional life. Traders and investors obviously use it. All business people, everybody at Davos is using news and needs to know that the news they're relying on to make decisions is accurate. Individuals make all sorts of personal decisions based on the accuracy of what they might read in a, in a newspaper or, or online. They're making decisions about insurance, about what kind of house they're going to buy, what kind of car they're going to buy. Um, and ideally, they're also making political decisions. What kind of policies are likely to help them? Uh, would a tax increase help or hurt them? Uh, would uh, better, more or less regulation of business help, help or hurt them in the long run? What's going to help the middle class? Um, get jobs. Um, ideally, you want in the political arena for them to care about, uh, I mean, it is in people's self-interest to, to, to need accurate information, but I think ultimately it's a need. And if you look at countries where there's a high level of censorship and there isn't information and people kind of know that, so North Korea, um, it's uh, tremendously dangerous to do this, but people smuggle in flash drives, they smuggle in DVDs, they listen to illegal radio at night because they want to know what's really going on outside North Korea. It's really important to them. In countries that have firewalls, people find all sorts of technological solutions to get around the firewall because they want to get at the truth. They want to know what's really going on. Um, so yes, yeah, sure, there are organizations that are out there uh, proliferating um, fake news, but I think there is a drive towards trusted information that's really kind of very deep in, in people's set, set of needs, and that, that is going to be as strong or stronger going forward. I think, I think somebody who loves the media, anyone who would love the media, would take great heart from the fact that subscriptions are, are going up in the, in the aftermath of the US election. But what I suppose I, I'm worried about is the development of a, a digital underclass of those that 
are not even aware, you mentioned yourself, um, awareness and education, digital literacy, not even aware or unable to afford to pay for news. And, and whether that is, they're left adrift. They're not able to, you know, they've got no guidance whatsoever and there's a lot of news out there. And if the fake news is, you know, getting better at proliferating, then, you know, that's a pretty hopeless situation, Rebecca. You know, I, I don't think that's going to be where we end up, or it doesn't have to be. I mean, it's, it's one possible reality, but it's certainly not an inevitable reality. I think, I think yes, there are some uh, news organizations that have, are, are going to have a you know, subscription model, and there are people who can't afford that information, but there are plenty of sources out there of public interest, public-minded, uh, organizations that are putting information out there that's freely accessible. Uh, and we certainly need to continue those types of institutions. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think this is again where we need to think about, uh, you know, do you just leave it all up to prox profit mag maximizing corporations to, to um, and, and then politically motivated groups? to create our information ecosystem? Or is there a public good that needs to be supported other ways um, to, to make sure that people even who are very low income have access to information? And you know that's certainly been a part of civic life in many countries, you know, that, that, that there is a public service aspect of, of information. And so we, we can't forget that. Um, we need to figure out how to bake it in going forward. And there has been a big flow of, of private money into news in the last few years, ProPublica, Marshall Project, uh, even Jeff Bezos buying the Washington Post and putting a huge amount of money into it, which I'm sure he'd like to make a profit, but it also seems to be part of just a desire to, to build out a stronger news organization. And so, so I do think, and that's gone way back, there have been people who have bought uh, media organizations, sometimes for political purpose, but sometimes really for philanthropic purpose. So I think that becomes part of the ecosystem of how news organizations are, are funded. You have some governments funding it, and like, like the BBC trying to create something that's largely independent, um, and you've got private enterprise, and you, and you have some, still some very good business models out there that will continue to uh, produce trusted news. Let's see if there are any questions from the floor. Is that a hand? No. <laughs> it was a nose scratch. <laughs> Rebecca, you, um, and we don't have very long, but I, just want to, I do want to find out a little bit, about, bit more about the work you do on a daily basis. You, you advise businesses. What, what are their, what's their biggest concern? So what, what Ranking Digital Rights does is we, we actually evaluate internet, telecommunications, mobile companies, sort of the biggest large listed uh, companies on their policies and practices that affect users' freedom of expression and privacy. Uh, and, and we have a whole set of indicators where we're asking questions, we're evaluating how well they're doing, and we're, we're really looking at transparency. So not only do the, com do the companies have commitments to respect their users' rights, but what are the specific policies that they've got in place? So are they informing users about uh, what data is being collected about them, with whom it's being shared. Are they informing users? So if, if, if a user wanted to know, okay, if somebody took the information that Facebook has on me and created a dossier, what would that look like? You know, Facebook ought to be disclosing enough information so that I can understand that. Similarly, uh, when companies, all, all companies have terms and conditions uh, where you're allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. How are they enforcing them? Um, what 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 are they taking down under what conditions? How you know is there an appeals process so so that that uh, if a user feels you know a woman women named ISIS have been kicked off of Facebook by mistake you know is there an appeals mechanism for them to get reinstated if they don't have friends in media? Uh, the appeals mechanism right now doesn't work very well, right? So how do how do you build a better redress mechanism? Um, are companies being transparent about the government requests they're receiving to remove content uh, and the volume and nature of content they're removing? 
uh, under what conditions so that people can hold accountable who's responsible for this content being removed. Um, we need to see more accountability around algorithms. Again, sort of what is shaping what people see and what don't see, who's making the decisions, who has the power over what I'm able to say, what I'm not able to say, what I'm able to see, what I'm not able to see, and who's able to see what about me. We, we need, if we don't have clarity and transparency about that by companies, then people are frankly going to feel even more manipulated and more mistrustful of the entire environment. And I think that's gonna cause people to, to latch even more onto demagoguery. Um, but, but also people aren't going to be able to advocate for, for what they believe in or, or obtain information that might go against the mainstream somehow. So what is their concern? And what is the area where you see most, you know, most lacking? Well, by most companies. Need, yes, most need to toughen up. Yeah, well, I mean, companies are, are very unclear right now. Um, even those that kind of publish a lot of policies, when it comes to exactly what are you collecting about me, you know, what, what kind of profile could be created on me with the information you have, they don't communicate clearly. Um, and so that's, that's one very big issue. Another really big issue is, again, transparency uh, around private rules, that, that companies are, at, at least the big kind of U.S. and European companies, are starting to get more transparent about requests they're getting from governments. But in terms of how they enforce their own terms and conditions, um, it's a complete back black box. Um, and this is a real problem because you're, you're seeing people on a daily basis having accounts deactivated or content removed and they don't know why. And they're not able to, to get redress on that. So that's kind of the flip side of this whole fake news debate, which is that already there's no accountability about the decisions that, that the companies are making about the rules not clear redress and appeal. Uh, it's, it's very, very arbitrary. People are feeling tracked, that they don't have control over who knows what about them. Um, and, and so we need to make sure going forward, and sort of the connection between what I do and, and this debate is we, we don't want to get into a situation where companies are expected even more to be arbiters of speech and it becomes even less transparent. And these people are not elected, they're not public officials, they're just random people that got hired you know, through some process. And, and who are they to decide what the public needs to know or not? Um, and so there, there's a need for accountability, um, but also need to, to be very careful about where the responsibility is placed and do you really want to put that responsibility onto companies? And Stephen, you've mentioned accountability and, and transparency. What, what is the single greatest intervention, development that you would like to see to, to, to protect our global commons from misinformation? Well, I, you know, I, I think the, uh, the trend towards fact-checking is useful. Um, I don't know exactly how it should be done, but the notion that uh, when things are challenged or questions, there, there's the ability to have a, some sort of fact-checking consortium out there. Um, is probably helpful. Um, there's also algorithmic fact-checking, which some people are a little leery of, but uh, we at Reuters have developed our own algorithmic uh, tool called News Tracer. Essentially identifies events that uh, are purported to have occurred uh, looking at social media, and then it puts it through a whole bunch of algorithmic tests to see if it's likely to be true, and it gives it a star rating as to how likely it is to be true. It's, it's not uh, your final, it's, it's sort of your first step in looking at that information, but it's very useful to us in the newsroom quickly to see did that earthquake occur, did that terrorist attack occur. So technology will help uh, give people a better sense. Um, but, but I would really just go back. I've heard some arguments in favor of censorship here at Davos this week, and I would just be so cautious about going down that path. It's so tempting. People say, well, you just get the government to say, you get rid of fake news, you can't do it. Uh, if, it's, if it's a rumor, uh, you can't publish it. Um, and you see that in authoritarian regimes. It's a terrible idea. And by and large, and we say this all the time, um, you, 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 there's a cost uh, to free speech. The cost of free speech is sometimes people uh, malign other people, sometimes people say things falsely, but if you don't have free speech, you don't have free society. So I would really push 
hard against the, the argument that fake news is an excuse for censorship. It's, that just should not happen. Rebecca, before we close, just one last question. What, what is your priority for the coming year in terms of the work you do? Uh, well, the work, uh, uh, my project is putting out its second uh, corporate accountability index where we're going to be ranking uh, um, 22 companies on their policies and practices. And we're going to be really focusing this year on mobile ecosystems. As, as we call them. Uh, and uh, you've probably seen in the news, uh, you know, another choke point for speech is app stores. Uh, and there, there was a lot of controversy recently about Apple removing the New York Times app uh, from the Chinese Apple App Store. Um, and so we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at uh, our companies being transparent and accountable about how they manage content in app stores when increasingly this is a choke point for expression and, and for privacy and for people to be tracked. And is there enough clarity about who's responsible for, for making decisions about what we can and cannot do with our apps or what apps we can use and, and who can make apps and who can distribute them to whom. Um, there's, there's a real issue here in, in the public discourse about that that I think people aren't looking closely enough at. Well, let's see how the events of next, this year unfold. Thank you both very much indeed for joining us. I know thank you have you to get much. onto your next schedule. Um, thank you very much for joining us here in the room and also for those of you watching us live online via Facebook and our website. This session is now over.